It has been many years since my mom threw away my sci-fi collection, having considered their literary value just a tad above the average tabloid. Little did she know what inspiration many of those visionary writings, including William Gibson's Neuromancer, had on scores of artists, scientists, and thinkers. But above all their prophetic power, these books are simply great reads, with young heroes struggling to make sense of a dystopian environment chased by some shadowy power. Gibson himself puts the significance of his early work into perspective in the 2001 documentary No Maps for These Territories. It sounds good. It sounds like something was written in the 1940s somehow. And I think of Neuromancer as being, in a good sense, an adolescent. The film portrays an unassuming Gibson sitting in the back of a cab, reflecting on his life and inspirations. It was presented as a teaser for the real thing, the author's reading in SL. The setting was kind of high-tech, low-life. Some 50-odd Gibsonites were ejected from the auditorium and into the surrounding water shortly before the event kicked off. We all had to fly back, just in time for Gibson's dramatic entry. When the celebrated author read from his new spook country, his prose had the raw immediacy his fans admire. In this passage, the heroine Hollis Henry encounters a storm atypical for the story's Southern California setting. She watches it from her LA hotel room. Outside, wind found her windows from a new angle. Any very pronounced weather here worried her. It got written up, she knew, in the next day's papers like some lesser species of earthquake. House-sized boulders coasted majestically down hillsides into busy intersections. She'd been here for that once. Gibson can still create places of alienation that are strangely desirable at the same time, even though the real world has moved closer to his imagined one, plagued by social inequity and corporate dominance. In the Q&A session following the reading, Gibson talked about his motivation for writing Neuromancer back in the 80s. Science fiction had become like Nashville country. I wanted to get back to what science fiction had felt like to me when I was 15 years old. I was in the middle of the 60s when science fiction was really pretty seriously rocking. Penguin Books is the publisher of Gibson's work in the UK. They opted not to buy their own private island in SL, but instead designed an elegant series of interconnected platforms hovering high above the mainland. A typewriter is synced to a Twitter page, and giant headphones invite visitors to sample audiobooks. Digital publisher at Penguin, Jeremy Newman, says he plans to use SL to directly connect writers with communities they inspired. We have a steampunk novelist, and I would like him to go and speak in Caledon and to the community that live their virtual lives according to the rules of steampunk. That's where marketing is going, is talking to niche communities. As the William Gibson appearance nears its end, the master shared his thoughts on Neuromancer's place in the pantheon of literature more than 20 years after its initial publication. I gave them something they could carry around and give to business people who didn't have a clue what they were talking about. A sort of model that they could convince their mother others to allow them to try to do what they had decided they could do. I knew it. If my mom hadn't trashed my sci-fi collection, I would now probably be some Silicon Valley hotshot or a visionary movie director. Ah, oh, what the hell, who's ever completely happy these days? If you ever run into me in Second Life, I hope I won't look quite so much like Quentin Tarantino. Thank you. For Life For You News, this is Dragster Dupree.